Chapter 7, Pain Assessment and Management in Children. Pain, uh, in kids it's just like with adults. Pain is whatever the person experiencing it says it is, and it exists whenever that person says it does. We cannot feel the pain, only the person experiencing it can feel it and tell us what it really is like. In kids, we want to believe both verbal and nonverbal expressions of pain. Kids may be very hesitant to admit to pain because they're afraid we're going to give them a shot or do some other painful thing to them to if they admit to pain. So we want to look for nonverbal clues and not just rely on what they verbally say. And the BRN has a policy that says we don't have to wait for a patient request in order to give pain medicine. And that's good news in pediatrics. So we can look at those nonverbal signs and decide that yes, this, this kid needs some pain medicine even if they haven't said they want it or said that they're in pain. Now kids um, are often undertreated for pain and part of that is fear of addiction and fear of respiratory depression. Uh, family can be very afraid of addiction and nurses are afraid if I give this kid pain medicine and it slows down their breathing, um, you know, I'd rather give less but then kids end up undertreated for pain. So how do we assess pain? There's three different ways. We can look behaviorally, what's the child doing, physiologically, and then self-report from the child. So which one should we use? For behavioral, that's really the only way we can, or, or the best way to assess pain in infants. There are some physiologic things, but mostly we're looking at behaviors and kids who can't verbalize uh, what's going on with them we're going to look at behavioral clues as to whether or not they're in pain. Physiologic you know it's just not reliable in children. Um, are they crying because they're scared or because they're in pain? Is their blood pressure and the heart rate up because they're in the hospital and mom just left or because they're in pain. The sort of stressors that they're experiencing cause the same physiologic changes as pain. So how do we know which one it is? And then self-report is very good, but you have to choose the right tool when you're working with kids. So let's look a little more at each of those. A behavioral assessment. What are we looking for? Well, we're looking for distress behaviors. So we're wanting to look at vocalizations, facial expressions and body movements. And this is what I said earlier, it's difficult to distinguish pain from some other stress. So we've got to figure out are they crying and acting like this because mom just left or because they're in pain? Or, you know, that's just an example, but is there some other stress that's causing these uh, behaviors as opposed to the pain? Um, behavioral assessments for short, sharp, procedural type pains, they're very good. The kid is fine, you poke them and they suddenly are crying. Chronic pain, little harder to use behavioral assessments. Uh, children's uses the FLAC scale for doing those behavioral assessments. And we'll look at the FLAC scale in a little bit. Now, for an inference response to pain, these next slides all come from the box uh, 7-1. A young infant, they're going to get rigid or thrash. They're going to cry loudly and you're going to see their face just scrunch up. You're going to get that facial expression of pain. A, an infant, especially a young infant, they have no connection between the thing that caused the pain and the pain. They can see you holding the needle, but they don't cry till you poke them. An older infant, rather than that getting rigid or thrashing, they'll pull away, uh, you know, the arm or the foot or whatever it is that you're doing the painful thing to. They will also cry. You'll get the same, same facial grimacing. Uh, the, you may get some physical resistance where they try and push away the thing that, that gave them the pain. So if you poke them, they're going to push your hand with the needle in it that you poke them with. A young child's response to pain, again, you're going to get crying or screaming, but they also can do some verbalizing, ow, ouch, it hurts. You'll get some thrashing. 
um, they'll also attempt to push away the whatever it is you have that, that's causing the pain. Kids this age, you might need to restrain them uh, because they realize what's coming and the behaviors are going to begin before the actual pain. When they see the treatment room or they see the needle or they see whatever it is you're doing, they're going to be upset. All these behaviors are going to begin then, not just when the pain occurs. For a school age child, these kids, they tend to regress when they're in the hospital and you may see them use all the behaviors of a younger child, particularly when they're in pain. The other thing you'll see them do is stalling, where you you say we need to go to the treatment room now and they'll say let me eat my breakfast first, let me watch this TV show first, let me dress my dolly first, let me whatever. They'll keep saying wait, 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 wait and they'll find things to put it off. They're hoping to put it off forever. So you can you know maybe say one thing, one you know whatever, one chicken nugget and then we go or whatever it might be they're using to stall you. These kids will get really stiff and rigid, usually as opposed to the thrashing around. Unless they just revert and, you know, some of them may actually do the thrashing. Uh, adolescents, they're not going to have the crying, ouch sort of response. They're not going to thrash around. They're able to verbalize and say, that hurts, you're hurting me. And what they'll do is just get very stiff. They get that muscle tension and stiff body. Here's our flax scale. And this is what children's uses uh, for anyone who can't verbalize or uh, use a like a the faces scale. And you can have pain between zero and ten. You can have a zero, a one, or a two in five different letter five different areas, and that's where the letters for the flax come from. You look at the face, you look at the legs, the activity, cry, and consolability. And you can see each has a, a behavior that goes with a zero, with a one, with a two, and then you add up the total and you have somewhere between zero and ten for your pain. Here's a, a face of a baby. You can see the face is all scrunched up, the eyes are closed, the mouth is open and yelling, screaming, um, typical facial expression of pain. Okay, for physiologic measures, what would we see? Um, we did say these are not great to use because it's hard to tell if it's some other form of stress about being in the hospital or being sick or being nauseous or whatever, or is it pain? Well, I mean, we're, sh we're still going to see these. The problem is distinguishing are they only because of pain. You are going to see heart rate changes. You'll see it go up, respiratory rate will change, blood pressure will change, sweaty palms, cortisone levels. We're not going to draw labs just to find out, but those would be elevated. If your child's on a, a transcutaneous oxygen monitor, you'll see changes in uh, oxygenation or ox oxygen carrying uh, levels, vagal tone, um, and endorphin concentrations. Your book lists a lot of different pain rating scales that can be used for children. This just lists the different ones your, your book talks about. The one they use at Children's Hospital, which because of that is really the only one I care about, but when you're studying for NCLEX, uh, NCLEX is a whole lot bigger than just Children's Hospital, so you may want to look at the others. But for us, we're going to talk about the FACES scale. At Children's, their policy is to use it for anyone three years or older. And they have these little pictures. They used to be all over. Now that they've gone to electronic charting, we'll have to figure out where they are. Um, but you show them to the child and ask which one. Now, the thing with children, oh, which is misspelled there, um, they're egocentric. They really only see things from their own perspective. So telling them a story about someone else doesn't register. They know how they feel. They don't really understand how someone else feels. They're concrete and they're perceptual. Um, so you want to use simple concrete words. 
um, is it a small owie, a big owie, or the biggest owie, or whatever term the child knows. Use simple words, specific words, don't say, um, you know, extreme, moderate, mild, use words that kids are going to understand. Uh, yeah, so avoid things like least or intense. Pain in neonates. Way back when, they used to say that neonates really didn't experience pain, but that's just not true. We know that, that neonates do feel pain. They neurologically are capable of feeling pain, and that was the argument in the past, was that neurologically they just weren't um, developed to that point. So if something would cause pain to an adult or an older child, assume that it also is going to cause pain to your newborn. One thing with the newborns is they don't understand the relationship between the stimuli that cause the pain and the pain. So they can see the needle coming or whatever it might be, and they have no idea that thing is going to cause them pain until the pain occurs, and they really don't make the connection um, that the two went together. The pain behaviors you're going to see, you're, that for vocalization, they're going to cry, that scrunched up face, and body movements. Um, some just get kind of stretch out and get stiff and rigid and others will thrash around. And here's a couple of pictures showing a baby who just got a, a heel stick. <laughs>